Please keep uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 open on page 1150. Um, And before we study it, let me pray for us. Our loving Father, as we have just sung, we pray that as we come to hear your word, that you would open up our hearts and minds and wills, that you would comfort, guide and reprove us, and then send us out to act your word out in our lives to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the early days of the state of Massachusetts uh, on America's eastern seaboard, uh, the folk who lived on Nantucket Island, just off Cape Cod, were so distressed by the number of seafarers who were drowned in storms off their rocky coast that they formed what they called the Nantucket Humane Society. The society built coastal lookouts, and they would man them when storms struck. Many lives were saved. And they had a motto. You have to go out, but you don't have to come back. Some motto. But it tells us what made them tick. Well, in this series of sermons on Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, we've been finding out what makes Paul tick. And in this ninth chapter, Paul has a motto of his own, for the gospel's sake. It may not immediately appear quite as compelling as that of the Nantucket Humane Society, to which we'll return later. But as we shall see, Paul is in the same business, the life-saving business. If you were here last week, Paul seemed to be talking about a food issue. But we also saw in chapter 8 that what Paul was really addressing was an attitude issue. That whilst knowledge of God tells us what rights we have, love of God shapes whether we use them or not. And it's that same attitude issue that Paul continues here in chapter 9. In chapter 8, Paul established that it's better to surrender our rights than claim them and harm a fellow brother or sister. Love leads to sacrifice. And that's really the bridge between chapter 8 and chapter 9. I've divided this morning's passage into three sections, and there's an outline on the back of the service sheet if you want to keep an eye on where we're going. So first, Paul surrenders his financial rights in verses 1 to 18. I don't know whether you were following the uh, scandal surrounding FIFA at the end of May. There was that moment when seven FIFA officials were arrested at a posh Zurich hotel, officials for whom it would appear that the term kickback means a little more than passing the ball back to the goalkeeper. And then there was President Seb Blatter's call for unity speech, in which, I was surprised to see, he said this. I ask you to reflect on why we are all in football. Not for greed, not for exploitation, not for power, but for love and to serve other people. Oh, I see, Mr. Bass, you're doing it all for love. So you'll be handing back your £600,000 annual salary then. Well, it was to avoid such contradictions that Paul wants to explain to the Christians in Corinth that he has surrendered his financial rights. You see, Paul didn't want to be the first century equivalent of Seb Latter. Neither did he want the church to be the first century equivalent of FIFA. Indeed, if you'll forgive the pun... Paul doesn't take a fee for anything. So let's follow Paul's argument in this first section. In verse 1, Paul asks four rhetorical questions, all of which presume the answer yes. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Yes, of course you are, Paul. As a Roman citizen, you're free. And you have the hallmarks of genuine apostleship, commissioned by the risen Christ on the Damascus Road. And yes, Paul, 
you actually planted this Corinthian church. And so Paul continues in verse 2, even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. Yes, Paul, of course you are. And so as a true apostle, Paul has certain rights. The right to food and drink in verse 4. The right to travelling expenses and accommodation in verse 5. The right not to have to do other work in order to make a living, verse 6. And then in verses 7 to 14, Paul gives illustrations to back up his rights. In verse 7, he gives secular examples. Soldiers, vineyard workers, shepherds. And then in verses 8 to 14, Paul gives biblical examples. The law of Moses in verses 8 to 10, where he quotes from Deuteronomy. And interestingly, likens Christian ministers to an ox treading the grain. That should keep them humble. Paul goes on to draw from examples from the temple, verse 13, and then from the teaching of Jesus himself in verse 14. Well, given all that, there's no doubt that Paul's argument is irrefutable. Paul has financial rights. So having spent 14 verses establishing his rights, what does he say about them? Verse 15, but I have not used any of these rights. In fact, did you notice he slipped it in earlier? Having asked 15 rhetorical questions in just 11 and a half verses, look at the second half of verse 12. But we did not use this right. And why not, Paul? Read on in verse 12. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. There's Paul's motto, for the gospel's sake. So yes, Paul really is an apostle. Paul really has seen the risen Lord. Yes, Paul did plant the Corinthian church. And yes, even though there are numerous secular and biblical reasons why Paul has these rights, he doesn't use them. And why not? So as not to hinder the gospel. As John Stott puts it, when for Paul the progress of the gospel and personal financial gain are in competition with one another, the gospel always takes precedence. And so as we read on in verse 15, we see that this letter is also not one of those slightly spurious missionary prayer letters that go perhaps something like this. God's work is hard, but we've learnt to be satisfied with what God gives us. And we're not wanting to burden you with any requests for money. Uh, But if you did feel moved, then please make a cheque payable to our holiday fund. No, Paul says, I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. And in verses 16 to 18, Paul explains that he couldn't accept money for preaching in any case, because he has no choice but to preach it. The other apostles, he says, were in some senses volunteers. But not me, he says. I was conscripted on the Damascus Road. So what then is Paul's reward? Verse 18, that in preaching the gospel, I might offer it free of charge. What a refreshing attitude. What a deeply Christian perspective to offer the gospel free of charge. So one might say that the Christian gospel should have one thing in common with the National Health Service. It should be free of charge at the point of delivery. So how is it for us? Which is more important, the spread of the gospel in Bournemouth at our own expense or our own living standard at the gospel's expense. Which do I put first, the gospel or my wealth? It's quite clear where Paul's priority was, for the sake of the gospel. It was said of the 20th century Christian businessman John Lang that he could have died a very rich man, but by the grace of God he did not. And why? Why? 
because he gave most of his money away for gospel work. And what about my time? But I have a right to spend my time how I like, we say. And indeed we do. But we also have the freedom to give some of it up in loving hospitality for those in particular need. To help on a Christian summer holiday for youngsters. To fill a gap in a church rota. Well, Paul has just explained his material distinctiveness in these first 18 verses, and now he goes on to tell us about his relational distinctiveness. Because spreading the gospel, whether it's done here in church or at home or in the street with our neighbours or at school or in the office, is a relational business. It's not like spraying roses to get rid of black fly, you know, best done at arm's length. And so secondly, Paul tells us that for the sake of the gospel, he has surrendered his personal independence, verses 19 to 23. Now, if you remember, he began the chapter with the question, am I not free? And of course, as a Roman citizen, Paul was a free man. But now look at verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave or a servant to everyone. When Archbishop Justin Welby was enthroned, or installed as he preferred to term it, he broke with tradition. Archbishops of Canterbury were usually greeted at the west door of Canterbury Cathedral by the Cathedral Dean. But as Welby entered, he was instead met by a 17-year-old Sri Lankan Christian who asked Welby these questions. First, who are you? Welby replied, I am Justin, a servant of Jesus Christ. Second, why have you been sent to us? Welby replied, I am sent as bishop to serve. And that is how Paul came to people as a servant of Christ. And why did he do that in verse 19? To win as many as possible. In other words, for the gospel's sake. And to do that, Paul was prepared to compromise. No, not compromise the gospel. Paul would never do that, and neither, of course, should we. But compromise on matters of what we might call matters of indifference. So Paul will make concessions if it makes it easier for people to hear and receive the gospel. To the Jews, Paul says in verse 20, I became like a Jew. And so we hear in Acts 18, for example, how Paul shaved his head because of a Jewish vow. And in Acts 21, that he purified himself before entering the Jewish temple. Now, he didn't have to do those things, but he did them out of love. He did them for the gospel's sake. And if we ponder this phrase a moment, to the Jews I became like a Jew, we'll see what a challenging thing this is for us, because, of course, Paul was a Jew, or had been a Jew. So Paul is willing, providing the gospel is not compromised, to go back to his Jewishness for the gospel's sake. My wife and I have a good friend who's an Anglican minister. And he had for many a year served in churches where, like here at Christ Church, the liturgy was fairly relaxed and as was the ministerial dress code, so uh, clerical robes were not worn. But then the opportunity came for him to serve in a church where the services were highly liturgical and where the tradition was that robes were always worn. So what to do? As far as I'm concerned, robes are in, he told us when we visited him early in his ministry. I could have changed the liturgy and just turned up in a jacket and tie, but I've changed for the gospel's sake. He might have added, to the very Anglican, I became like a very Anglican, to win very Anglicans for Christ. Like Paul, our friend was prepared to surrender his personal independence for the gospel's sake. 
And in verses 20 to 22, Paul expands the same principle to other groups, rising to the climax in the second half of verse 22. I have become all things to all men. And why would you do that, Paul? So that by all means I might save some for the gospel's sake. Now, I think this phrase, all things to all men, must be one of the most misquoted and misapplied phrases by Christians in the entire Bible. Indeed, it's come to be nowadays a term of abuse to refer to someone who's a kind of two-faced, unprincipled compromiser. No, that's not what Paul meant. Paul would never surrender his doctrinal or ethical positions, and neither should we. But as John Stott again so beautifully puts it, although Paul was hard as a rock in his faith, he was pliable as a reed in his love. And why? Verse 23, you've guessed it. I do all this for the sake of the gospel. So to briefly recap, Paul has surrendered his financial rights and his personal independence. And finally, Paul surrenders his physical indulgence, verses 24 to 27. Now, Paul's original readers would have been familiar with the Isthmian Games. Uh, they were held in Corinth or in their environs of every two years. And it's maybe with these contests in mind that Paul uses the worlds of athletics and boxing to illustrate this third point. In verse 25, he reminds them of the strict training to which the competitors would subject themselves. And all for what Paul calls a crown that will not last. Well, my research shows that nothing has changed in today's sporting world. I don't know how many of us enjoy a game of golf. Well, I looked up Rory McIlroy's training regime, and it, it's truly awesome. There was I think he just gets on a golf course and knocks a few balls around. Far from it. Uh, he trains in the gym six days a week, 52 weeks of the year performing such things as, I've no idea what this is, a 200-pound trap bar dead lifts. But it sounds tremendous. Now, if someone will do all that to be the best hitter of a 1.68 diameter ball into a 4.25 diameter hole for a piece of tarnishing silverware, what are you and I up for in order to bring the good news of the Christian gospel to folk that both they and we might, in the words of verse 25, get a crown that will last forever. Now, I hasten to add that this self-discipline to which Paul is exhorting us is not, of course, the means by which you and I earn eternal life. But our self-discipline ought to be an outward evidence of the salvation that Christ has won for us and by his grace given to us. Therefore, Paul says in verse 26, I do, not run like, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. And then suddenly, Paul switches from athletics to boxing. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, verse 27, I beat my body. Literally, it means I turn it black and blue and make it my slave. There's that word again. Remember in verse 19, Paul said he was a slave to everyone. But you see, in order to be a slave to others, he's got to make his body a slave to himself. So again, how is it for us? Are we spiritually running in such a way as to get the prize? When it comes to prayer and Bible study and acts of loving service to others, are we in strict training or just running aimlessly? Are we, as it were, just putting on the Winter Garden's crazy golf course? Or are we spiritual Rory McElroys? Do we share Paul's all-consuming commitment to the gospel? Or do we see Christianity as a spectator sport, best left to the paid professionals?
Paul lived with the gospel as more important than his financial rights, as more important than his personal independence, and as more important than his own physical indulgence. But then, isn't that how Christ himself lived on this earth? After all, he was entitled to glory, but he chose suffering. He was entitled to justice, but he took injustice. He was entitled to the respect of people, but he opted for their mockery. He was entitled to a life of pain-free ease, but he decided on a cruelly agonizing death. Jesus lived and died with the gospel as more important than his rights. And as followers of Jesus, shouldn't we be doing the same? And if we do choose to follow Christ's example, we will then reflect, though only in some very pale way, the one who on the cross lived out that motto of the Nantucket Humane Society, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. Oh, which reminds me, I hadn't quite finished their story. Well, you see, times changed, and after a while, the US Coast Guard took over the task of sea rescue. For a time, the two organizations lived together. But in the end, the idea that carried the day was, let the professionals do it. And so the volunteers stopped manning those small huts along the coastline, and they stopped sending out teams to rescue drowning people. But they couldn't quite bring themselves to disband. Indeed, the members still meet every once in a while, enjoy each other's company, have dinner together. And after all, they've a right to do that, haven't they? It's just that they're not in the life-saving business anymore. But although things may have changed in that kind of life-saving, when it comes to the church and the gospel, nothing should have changed. Because nothing has replaced you and me as the most effective way that God uses of allowing family and friends and neighbors to hear the Christian gospel. But then if we live by our rights, if we just enjoy each other's company on a Sunday, we won't be in the life-saving business anymore. And someone needs to keep asking the question, are we as a church and as we as individuals still in the life-saving business? Pray God the answer is always yes. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that we may leave this place this morning in the words of our final hymn, in Christ to live and love and serve and care. Keep us as a church and as individuals in your life-saving business. And we ask this for your glory. Amen.